Hi, I'm Kip Bradford, um, and I'm going to talk today about something that's not my usual area of subject. So this is a fairly fresh talk, not the thing that I've recycled through countless maker fairs and other presentations. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all of the people who helped put this on, Peter and Tino and the rest of the, uh, the team from, from TEDx Providence. And um, Jack was just talking about some ways to make Providence and Rhode Island really profoundly better for the entrepreneurship community. Um, and a lot of that talked about capturing the 23-year-old energy. I'm going to back up a little bit and uh, talk about something that has recently become somewhat important to me. Um, as I thought about this talk and a bunch of talks that I'm giving uh, at Maker Faires coming up, I thought, you know, I've, I've been talking about the stuff that I make, and people see that online, and my company is in the process of, of launching some new products. So, so maybe I should be talking about something different. Uh, maybe I should be talking about something that, that really isn't being talked about at all, uh, about the fact that I was the only black kid to graduate in my class from engineering with a degree in engineering, uh, in an SCB in engineering, and that I'm one of the few people in the maker community who's black. So as I reflected on that, I said, there's a problem here, and the solution is something that won't just help black kids, but really will help every kid see a brighter future. And I think that in working towards the solution uh, and working towards this very simple idea, uh, we can inspire kids. We can give kids a pathway to interesting possibilities. So um, I envision a future where science is the new football. And to understand what that future looks like, uh, I want to take a step back. And that step back, for me, uh, will look at some of the subtle forms of racism that really set kids off the path to be innovators and scientists, especially, uh, like I said, black kids. So, science is the new football. Um, this is a familiar picture to everyone. And with this picture comes a question to you, which is who are your heroes? Who are the people who inspired you to become who you are today? Who are the people who you look to when you had dreams and you said, I want to dream big, I want to be like that person? For uh, most of this country in the 60s when the first moon landing uh, and, and astronauts were a very big thing, uh, for most of this country, we celebrated and honored astronauts. They were the heroes, they were the adventurers, they embodied the American spirit. We revered these men and sometimes women, we idolized them. And even if you weren't alive when the moon landing took place, you probably could name this gentleman here who's saluting the flag on the moon. And many of you might know this astronaut, Alan Shepard, the first American in space. You probably know the name of John Glenn, the first American to to orbit the Earth. And you probably know these three men. Um, Michael Collins in the middle, you might not recognize that name. He was the, the uh, commander of the module that circled the moon, while Buzz Aldrin, the gentleman to your right, landed on the moon. And many of you, if not all of you, I'd hope, would know the name of Neil Armstrong, the first human being to ever step foot on the Earth. That event was watched by 93% of households in America, which is a fascinating statistic to me. But for many black youth, the idea that you could become an astronaut was a foreign idea because we didn't see people like us. It was something that was outside of our experience. That was somebody else's dream. That was somebody else's future. And for many of us, our first experience with the idea that black people were in outer space was Lando Calrissian from Star Wars and Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek. And when I was doing research for this talk, I came across this hero, Robert Lawrence, who was actually the first black person in the astronaut corps, accepted in 1967. How many of you knew that name? I certainly didn't, and this is my field. So that made me think, God, what is the problem here? The fact of the matter is that there are heroes in the black community who are leaders and innovators who were risk takers and adventurers, but we know nothing about them. We don't get to celebrate them, and we don't get to look up to them as people that we could be like. I want to see a show of hands of who thinks they know who the first black astronaut was. Not a single one of you. And don't feel bad. I couldn't remember his name either, although I'm having dinner with him sometime in May. Because 
he went to my parents' best friend's high school outside Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> and that astronaut is Guyan or Guy Bluford. And to the right is Mae Jameson, the first black woman in space. Now, Guy Bluford uh, was sent in space on a space shuttle in September of 1983. And that date is a very, very important date. Um, Mae Jameson uh, went into space in 1992. But the reason that Guy Bluford going into space on uh, September of 1993 is an important date was because of this. Because there was a boy in central St. Louis who had a dream, a dream of going to Mars. And in March of 1983, that precocious little youth, that was me, you probably, <laughs> probably guessed that, had a fantastic dream of becoming an astronaut and told his parents, I want to go to Mars. And for a school project, I wrote a book about this dream of going to Mars. Um, it was exciting. I was on the space shuttle. We took off. Uh, I was, I was going to be a pioneer in space. But a fairly tragic thing happened. And instead of this being received with enthusiasm and excitement by my teacher, who should have said to me, that's exciting. I really hope that you're an engineer or a scientist and that you get to go to Mars. Well, what happened was that teacher told me that black people don't do science and black people don't do math. And I said, but, but the pyramids. And she said, no, the pyramids were made by white people. The Egyptians didn't build the pyramids. They didn't have that kind of skill. And that was pretty amazing to me. It was pretty traumatic, and it was so traumatic that you see the areas that are scratched off here? The one on top said that my hobby is doing biology by collecting specimens and studying them. The one on the bottom said, my dream is to become an astronaut one day. So that's March 1983, seven months before the first black astronaut. And I didn't have the opportunity to look and say, but wait, there's an example of a black person who did become an astronaut, so you're wrong. There was nothing that countered what she was saying to me, except for my parents and my grandparents. So both my parents had science and math and chemistry scholarships to college. Um, both of my grandfathers were tinkerers. They were makers. They built stuff in their garages. I remember learning how a gasoline motor worked because my grandfather was showing me. Most of my cousins can weld. One of my uncles is a highly skilled uh, welder for NASA and uh, trains lots of other welders. The idea that I could be an engineer or a scientist, a maker, was something that was actually really familiar to me. And despite what that teacher was saying, I got so much encouragement and, and so much of environmental support from my family members that this is me a year after getting slapped down by that teacher, building a, um, a replica of a 747 out of Legos with retractable landing gear and working flaps. <laughs> <clears throat> so it was clear to me that this subtle racism is incredibly destructive. And it's incredibly destructive in ways that, that we don't really necessarily see until much, much later in life. And this is a pretty pathetic chart here. This shows the percentage of, of people who identify as black or African American in the general US population. So around 13% according to the US Census in 2010 versus the percentage of engineers who identify as black. You see that number is pathetically small. And it's pathetically small not because of a skill gap or an education gap. It's pathetically small to me because of a lack of inspiration, of lack of, of leadership, a lack of heroes, a lack of people who when teachers say, you can't be this or you can't be that, those heroes are people that kids can look up to and say, yes, I can. I can be different. Unfortunately, what black kids have to look up to is this. This is the number of black NFL players compared to blacks in the general population. So about 68% of the football players in the NFL are black or African American. That's a very telling statistic. And there are a lot of reasons why that's the case. A lot of reasons that we could get into today, but 
that's a much, much longer discussion. Tim Wise, in his book, um, White Like Me, made a very, very interesting observation. And I think it points to an answer. And he tells a story of a white football player in high school who was the fastest kid on the team and one of the most athletic and the most skilled kids on the team. Yet his coach routinely benched him over black players. Not because the black players were better, but because an expectation that the black players were naturally more athletic, that they were more physically talented. And there's an interesting corollary that goes with that. And that corollary is that talent on the field, athletic talent, is the antithesis of intellectual talent. So the more athletic ability you have, the less intellectual ability that you have. And this number is us as a society, as a culture, saying, you know, these kids, these black kids, their pathway is to professional football, not to science and math and engineering. And some of you might say, well, you know, but being a professional football player, that's a pretty cool gig. I mean, you get paid a lot, you get all the ladies, you get fast cars, and you know, it has a crazy lifestyle, and that might be true. Uh, and some of you might say, and, and plus, being an engineer, being a scientist, that's hard. I mean, yeah, certainly you're talking about uh, these opportunities and kids not following these, these crazy opportunities in science. But the question there is, what's harder? Being a professional football player or being a scientist or an engineer? I think the numbers show that you have a much, much, much greater chance. As a matter of fact, you have about 100 times greater chance of being a talented engineer or a scientist than you do uh, being a professional football player. So that gets to Another question, what are we inspiring our kids to do? What are we telling them is the way that they should be using their heads? Should they be using their heads as battering rams to take out people on opposing teams? Or should they be using their heads like Percy LeVon Julian, one of the uh, most famous black chemists who uh, shown here being an inspirational leader, thinker, using his head to discover, using his head to explore. And the message that I want to send today is that if we change this, what we're telling our kids, if we give, give kids hope and dreams of being scientists and being engineers, we're going to be providing a much better future for them. Now, that's not necessarily an easy thing to do because it means that we have to change the way we look at our heroes. We have to create heroes who are not just athletes, but provide kids a positive outlook where their heroes can be scientists, where their heroes can be nerds. Now, this is a problematic picture to me because it shows this dichotomy of image. It shows that, well, here's the picture of a football player who's tough, who's manly. I mean, this is the very embodiment of what it is to be a true American, tough, independent, strong. This is a man on the left. Some might say, well, yeah, that's actually kind of a gladiator. That's a scary, scary picture. But what's the opposite of that? Well, the opposite impression, the only popular cultural reference to uh, a black scientist that I could find is Urkel. And if this is the option, you either have gladiator, or you've got Urkel? Well, yeah. Every kid is going to be like, I think I want to be the gladiator on the left because the kid on the right, he's going to get the crap beaten out of him every day. <laughs> but I think that there are some other options. This is actually me racing bicycles at the U.S. National Championships for Cyclocross. And the other picture is me um, pretending to look cool at the Open Hardware Conference in New York. And I think you get what I'm saying, that we have some opportunities to change perception of what it means to be a scientist and what it means to be a hero in society. And I want to conclude by saying that the only way to do that is if, in addition to Sports Center every night on television, we have Science Center. And instead of just having the sports pages every day in the newspaper, we have the science pages. And in those news outlets, 
uh, in our popular culture and our media, we take the opportunity to celebrate scientists, to celebrate the human drama, to celebrate the achievements, the failures, to celebrate the excitement and discovery, that we take the opportunity to shift the perceptions of what it means to be a scientist, of being an engineer, of being a nerd, of being a valuable contributor to society, that we take the advantage, uh, uh, take the opportunity to, to put science into pop culture, into the media, that we take the way we approach football, uh, the, the Super Bowl, football in Europe and the World Cup, and the amount of media attention we give those, and we bring that attention, we shine that spotlight on the people who are changing the world and give kids positive role models that they can look up to as their heroes. And that is what it means to make football uh, science into the new football.